Queen End Games. Okay. A trick win in a queen versus rook pawn and queen versus bishop pawn on the seventh rank. Now, before we start, let me just give a little intro because some people may not have been here before. We're, we've been going through the Silman End Games, Complete End Games book, as the title of the stream suggests, but I know some people don't read the titles. So if you want to catch up and see what we've done prior to today, uh, most of the uh, lectures are still on video on demand on Twitch and also on the Chess Club YouTube channel. Um, we, we're uploading all of them, so they'll be there forever. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. I just want to catch people up. Usually a rook pawn will draw in a queen versus king and pawn on the seventh rank endgame. However, this position is an exception. The technique that white makes use of is important. It shows how in some endgames you can allow one side to promote his pawn to a queen and still win. King g6. So here we block the queen, and so it's not stalemate anymore. Check. In this kind of endgame, white wins if he can get his king into the box shown in this diagram. I'll put the box here. Do, 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 do. Is this right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's easier to do it by squares. There we go. Nice. So if white can get his king into this area, <laughs> then it'll win for white, even against a rook pawn, which is usually a draw. And the white king is in this area. How convenient. King f2. This threatens to queen. Wouldn't help to play king h1, king g4, blocking this, and thereby moving the white king closer. That wouldn't help black. So king f2 now threatening to push, and we can't move our king because he'll queen. Wait, I'm sorry. Go. I didn't understand what you were just saying. Repeat what you were just if saying. If king h1, king g4 moves the white king closer. King f2 stops us from moving our king closer because they can queen. They're threatening to queen right now. Right. So black doesn't want white's king to come closer. Right. White wants white's king closer. So black won't play a move to help white's king come closer. Black will play a move like this, and now you can't move your king because I'll queen. Okay. That's the better defense. You don't want the opponent's king coming closer. Okay, I see. Check. Yeah, if you go king g3 after queen b7, we we go queen h1 and by force next move, and we win then. So king g1 avoids that for now. And now here's the technique to win. We play king g4, x clam, allowing the black king or the black pawn rather to queen. Like this. But our king is close enough that after king g3, we still win this position. We're threatening mate, and there's no way for black to prevent mate uh, without giving up the queen. And thereby getting mated shortly thereafter. There's no check. There's no way to defend against all the potential mates. Like this and, and these. Mm -hmm. You know, if you move your queen away. Your queen can't defend all of those squares. Right, yeah. And get mated. Um... So, and or not get mated. So, black's going to have to resign here. And this is why if the king is close enough in this box before the pawn queens, that's why this is a win, because our king can get to the third rank and force this scenario where you lose with black, mm -hmm. even though you did queen. You still lose. Hey, Casper Vid. Yeah, so again, it's important that the queen is on the second rank for this. You know, okay. if your queen was off somewhere else, they could check you and such. And then you'd be, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a win. Might even lose. <laughs> mm -hmm. But probably not. Hey, intelligent. This idea is sometimes possible against bishop pawns. Uh, whether it does or doesn't work against the other pawn is of no consequence since the queen beats every other pawn, you know, the knight pawn or center pawns. Okay, let's say it like this.
as we learned before, usually a bishop pawn is going to draw. But uh, from this position, white to play, white actually wins. Obviously, black to play, he just promotes. White to play can actually win. Queen h2, the best possible square because we're on the second rank. That, that was how we won last time, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And we prevent queening. King e1, threatening to queen. And then we'll just play king f4, allowing him to queen with check, even. King e3, and this is the same scenario. It's black to play, but black can't stop mate and keep his queen. There's just no way. You're going to have to give up the queen in order to not get mated. And what's nice here is that the queen is on h2. Otherwise, like if, if the queen is over further away on the queen side, it would be queen h3 check and black could draw. But because the queen's on h2 covering h3, there's no check because of that. Mm -hmm. So this is a, you have to be a little bit in better position with white than against a rook pawn. Your queen has to stop the extra check that black is afforded by the fact that he promoted to uh, on, the, on the bishop square. Or like if you promote there, you have to control h3 then, so your queen would have to be on a2 in that scenario. And, and this is actually why a similar position won't win if we put black's king in a better square. Like this. This is the same thing that we saw, uh, but it's on the queen side instead of the king side. And we can't play queen a2 here because black's king is on a better square, controlling that. If we try the same thing here, queen e2, we could play king a1 x-clam. Remember, if they take, it's stalemate. This is a nice uh, improvement. Queen d2, this stops him from queening. King b4. Queen, and then we can't win. Well, we don't even have time to move our king because our queen's attacked here. But even if we, for example, last turn we played here, the queen, now we can't, uh, like if we play king b3, where he's afforded queen b1 check because his king's on a1. Mm -hmm. If we played here and the king was here, then yeah. this would still be a win, because our queen covers this square and our king covers that square. If you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. This would still be a win if the king was already on b1, but because he could play king a1 in this position, he could play king a1, this won't win anymore. Because he could play queen b1 here. Whereas king b1 here would, would lose for the, what we just saw. Because we can't play queen b1 here. This loses. Right. We got every square Can't covered. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in a, with a bishop pawn, mate is only possible if white has the move immediately after he promotes to the pawn, um, or if the queen can safely reach one of the specified squares that we talked about. Um, H2 doesn't win. Okay. Hey, L. Cohen. That's actually it for the Queen Endgame stuff here. Yeah, I'm, I might play some people at the end this is Spencer. Probably will. I usually do. I didn't yesterday, but I usually do. Can they just repeat to H1? Not sure what that means. I guess in the last position. Well, even still, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. I can't right. Anyways, uh, that's it for all of Part 6, actually. Oh, okay. We finished all of part six. This is all stuff that A players know. Well, not really, but you know. <laughs> Should know. <laughs> and that's not even necessarily true either. I would say if you talk to most A players, like you showed them the rook and pawn stuff that we looked at last time, there's mm -hmm. none of them would know that. Yeah. No way. This is just stuff that A players can digest mm -hmm. easily. Right. And it would be efficient for them to study it. I bet some of them have studied it. Yeah, I mean, if people have the book and, and remember mm -hmm. it. Not likely. <laughs> <laughs> I would really. I would expect an A player to remember things much better than a lower one. You don't think so? Yeah, but I don't. I think it's very unlikely they know any of the stuff we talked about in this chapter, in this part. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it seems like people.
study openings and such more than in games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I usually just study the middle game. Hmm. That's the most important part. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think it's harder. It's less defined. It's fuzzier, at least in my my brain, than the opening. Because there's so much opening theory, you know. That's potentially true, yeah. So I think people feel like they can get a handle on the opening better because of that. Well, yeah, a lot of opening is is about uh, memorization, Mm -hmm. whereas in the middle game you have to sort of think on your own Mm -hmm. and just figure it out. But equipping yourself with the tools to figure out a position is is pretty useful. I agree, but I'm sure that there are a lot of great books out there, but um, figuring it out on your own takes years, so then you're stuck with trying to find the right materials to help you figure it out Mm -hmm. or getting a coach, you know. I know there are a lot of good books, so. Well, an easy way to study the middle game is to analyze your own games. Mm-hmm. You know, if you play tournament games or play games online that are like a slower time control, then you can analyze those games and see how you can play the middle game better. Yeah, see where you're goofing up. Yeah, that's what I mostly did mm-hmm. to improve. That's cool. Did they have good engines back when you were younger? Well. Or is that a more recent development? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I didn't play and seriously until I was like seventeen. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was fourteen hundred when I was seventeen, and uh, that's when I, I really started to to pick it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you took some time off, didn't you? Yeah. Prior to that. Right. Mm-hmm. I stopped playing when I was about eleven. Yeah. So you know that was only about twelve years ago, so the sh- engines were strong twelve years ago. Yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah. Engines were strong. I remember Houdini was really good, and mm. people were using Houdini. Now you don't even hear about Houdini anymore. <laughs> You know, punch yeah. him in the stomach, I guess. <laughs> I guess he drowned. R.I.P. <laughs> All right, we're well, moving along. All right, so we'll look at end games for experts. This is for people rated over 2,000 to mm-hmm. 2,199. This is going to be really hard, but we'll still try our best. All right, we got Rick End Games. How high does the board, the board, the book go? I don't know. Or maybe the last part is like something else, like appendix or games. Let's see. Uh, I could check that. I was just curious. Master. It's a 2400. And then they have an extra part for pure pleasure. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, just after this one and the next one, there's only one part left. Okay. It's like after this case of beer and the next one, there's only <laughs> one case left. All right. Well, even though it's going to be hard, let's just forge ahead. All right. We probably have some higher rated people that drop in here and there. Yeah. Like Julian. Um, Let's see. At this point, you know enough basics to change your general mode of study. Instead of looking at isolated positions, we'll look at more complex situations that are made easy by being firmly schooled in all the foundation endgames. Here you'll be introduced to the concept of solving complicated positions by beginning with a very simple idea, Um, then by adding a bit more complexity to it and adding to it again. This flow of information, in essence a flowchart, can be used to deconstruct a surprising amount of endgames, no matter how advanced they might appear to be at first glance. All right, let's start with Rook Endgames. Rook Endgames are a mystery to most people, he says. Uh, if you don't know the building blocks of Rook End Games, you won't be able to play any Rook End Game properly. Knowledge is a must. So you're reading this ex- expert section, you should be well acquainted with the ins and outs of the basic Rook End Game theory, which is what we did, you know, the last few parts. Are you, are you perplexed? <laughs> I was trying to figure out if this was a different word, if he meant perplexed. Well, I mean, he hasn't even started... Um... The pres- I'm you look preplexed. <laughs> I'm not perplexed. This Th- part that's is... like before you're perplexed. Okay. You're preplexed. You know? Well, this part's a little bit um, fluff. I'm gonna say. Yeah, he's just talking. Yeah, you know, he just rambles a bit. That's all. <laughs> all right, taking a simple position into deeper water. We will now take a leap into the flowchart mentality, a simple technique that will enable you to turn many complex positions, which at first glance appear to be unintelligible into a simple situation you've already mastered. This is definitely something that I do in my games. Flowchart mentality? Well, I wouldn't call it that because I didn't know about that. But a lot of times you have like a really complicated position and you could force it to a position you already know. You know, like a theoretical position that you mm. already know and you can bring it down to that. 
And that's exactly what you should try to do when you're in a complex endgame. Mm -hmm. It's uh, He's talking about how the flowchart mentality is a form of transition. We take the game from one situation to another, and perhaps yet another. This can mean maneuvering a complex work endgame into a basic, well-known situation, or it can mean going from one specific kind of endgame into a completely different situa uh, yeah, situation. All right, let's start hmm. with the following confusing position. Hey, prophylaxis. Like this. Just give one pawn. <laughs> you do that all the time. The situation you know best is when you're mated. <laughs> Here's the situation. All right, so black to play. Remember, a flowchart is nothing more than a way of using basic knowledge to solve positions that seem complex. And that's a good thing to remember. So, now, I mean, I wouldn't have, it's weird to use, I, the, when I think of a flowchart in a different context. I, I you think of when it's like a line and then there's a box and it's like, do, do this, this, question mark? If this, then do this. Right. If this didn't, so that, yeah. I, I'm not sure that he's using flowchart correctly, but that's fine as long as we know how what he means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anywho. So there's this position. It's black to play. Can he win? Let's compare this position to a different one. like this with black to play so we can remember the difference right mm -hmm. hmm interesting let's see what he says the average expert or master would hazard a guess but would not be able to definitely figure out either of these positions I agree I was thinking I don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if maybe he's winning, you'll get to learn a little something well, I hope so. <laughs> we'll re we will return to them when you have the tools to make some educated deductions. So let's look at some building blocks. First. Here's the first building block one. Yeah, you know, I should make this scene so that we can have multiple analysis boards up. Nah, that's all right. Oh, you don't mind? Okay. Yeah. I just didn't know if you mind my having to re-enter the same. It is pretty quick. This position, we've already studied this one. Yesterday. Except it was white with the extra pawn. And white was queening, like, mm -hmm. around here. Yeah, yeah. But this is the same thing, and, and this is still going to be a draw. As we already know from that from yesterday. As long as White's King stays on H two and G two, Black's not gonna win with that trick that we learned last time. You know, Rook H one. So whenever the king goes and touches the pawn, we check him. We already learned that. And then he can't win. Yeah, check him away. Yeah, mm -hmm. so then the rook will never be able to move without losing the pawn, so the pawn won't be able to queen ever. All right, now let's look at building block two. Add a rook. And this is a nice pawn. little review, too. Yeah. Rule, king and rook draw versus king, rook, and a pawn on the seventh rank, with the rook trapped in front of it, and an h pawn. So this position's a draw. It's the same thing we looked at. The difference is we added this pawn, and that's not going to help black enough. This is still a draw. So you should. this is definitely something you can memorize. Mm -hmm. Black can't win because the H pawn isn't able to deprive the white king of both critical squares. Right, we, we can take away G2, but we can't take away H2. The king will still be able to stay on H2. For example, we'll make it black to play. Obviously, we can't take because then he'll check us mm -hmm. and queen. But so all we got to do is stay put now. Rook a8. Rook a7. Rook a8. Rook a7. 
And yeah, once he goes to, to touch the pawn, now he's threatening to move his rook. And then queen. So we check him. And then get behind the pawn. Mm -hmm. Et cetera, et cetera. All right, now let's look at the next building block. Here. Black to play, I guess? Yeah, black to play. Still, it's the same situation. The, uh, the king is going to be deprived of the h2 square once our pawn gets to g3, right? Mm -hmm. But we can stay on g2, so we won't get... Um, we won't get tricked with rook h1. Mm -hmm. We just take it. As long as we keep our king on g2. Rule. King and rook draw against king rook a pawn on the 7th rank with the rook in front of it and g pawn. So you got a rook pawn with a rook in front of it and you got a knight pawn on the opposite side of the board. Even this draws for the same reason. Same deal. There's nothing black can do. Black can try to do this again. We'll check him. Mm -hmm. Same as, as okay. we, same as it ever was. Same Won't as get railroaded. Was. Same All as right. it ever was. <laughs> All right. Now let's look at another one. Like this. Now white is going to lose this position. King and rook lose against king, rook, a pawn on the seventh rank with a rook trapped in front of it and an f pawn. This is going to lose for the for white, of course. This is new and very important. A win is suddenly effortless since the f pawn will successfully pull white's king off of both the critical h2 and g2 squares. His point is that if the pawn gets to f3, we stop g2. You could go to h2, but then we'll go f2. You can't allow me to play f2, then I'll win. Mm -hmm. No matter where your king is, if I play f2, I win. King takes f2, we'll play rook h1. Right? Or if your king is on h2 and I play f2, well, let's say even your rook can get behind it, then I'll move my rook and queen. So that's the problem, is that this pawn is going to force the king to go to, to f2, either to block it or to capture it. And this is going to allow the rook to go to h1. I'll show you, show you with these moves. Mm -hmm. f4, rook a8, f3 check, white can resign at this point. Hey, Kappa. Hey, Kappa, how's it nice. been going? So white can go here and then this. That's going to win, of course. Or white could go here and it's going to be this. And that's why this wins. We we stop him from going to g2 and h2. Mm -hmm. He has to go to f2, either by taking our pawn or by stopping it, and thereby losing to rook h1, because takes gets skewered, not takes gets promoted. So this is a win for black. All right. And so now we're learning more about the end game here. Mm-hmm. Tricky. We'll look at this position, which, as you can imagine, this is a draw. Because even without the pawn, we know it's a draw. Mm -hmm. We saw that position without the knight pawn, and we know it's a draw already. So adding the pawn usually won't hurt. It could hurt, actually, but <laughs> not this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking heads. That's what I love was. talking heads. I do, too. I'm surprised Same you as like talking heads. That I like talking yeah. heads? Yeah. Why? They're good. Yeah, but they're different than a lot of the other kind of music you like. Still good, though. Yeah, yeah. I love him. Yeah. In fact, he says what I said. This must be a draw because without the G-pawn, it's a draw. So even if we just give up the G-pawn, play rook a8 to a7, it'll draw. All right, so let's change it up a bit. We'll put this here. Like that. Nope, even further. There we go. We'll make it black to play. So now this is an interesting scenario. Black has the F pawn. As we saw earlier, that'll win if this pawn is gone. Mm -hmm. Because we can, you know, force the king to F2. 
But white does have an f-pawn himself here. So that makes it obviously a little tougher to push your f-pawn when your opponent has the f-pawn. Um, so with, in this exact position, however, black does win with accurate play. Since the building block where the pawn was gone, that's building block four. He refers to it as building block four. Since that was an easy win for black, it's clear that the same holds true if black wins the f-pawn. The winning method is simple and instructive. King c7. Black wants to attack the f-pawn, but obviously he's got to kick the rook away so that he can step up, first of all. There you go. And he's going to walk over here to take it now. Okay, now we're, here's a delicate scenario. If he plays king e3, white will play rook a4. And now black wishes it was white's turn here. Then white would be in Zugzwang. White would have to either move the rook away and lose the pawn, and then we're winning, because we already saw we were winning. Mm -hmm. White has to, or white could move the rook sideways and let me move my rook and queen. Or white could play king h2, king f3, and then still is in Zugzwang again. So this is a position that black wants, but he wants it to be white's turn. That's why black should play king e4 here. The only reasonable move, you can't play king g3 because I'll check you. The only reasonable move is rook a4 check, and then king e3. And now we have achieved the Zugzwang scenario. Yeah. Zugzwang. King h2, king f3. Now white has to give up the pawn. If he moves the rook, we move our rook and queen. If he, if he moves the rook up and down, we take it, and we're in building block four. Or if he goes here, it's mate in one. It's rook h1. Oh, yeah. Even if it wasn't mate, we would check in queen, so it's mm -hmm. no problem. Hey, Scottish demon goat's in the house. Nice. Hey, Scottish demon goat. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so that's an important scenario to understand. This will still lose even when white has the f-pawn because of Zugzwang. We can make the rook protect the pawn and stop the queen. But when the rook has to do two things like that, it's, it's going to be in Zugzwang potential, like we see here. Mm -hmm. If white didn't have to move, draw. White could just say pass, draw. But unfortunately, you have to move in chess. All right, so now we've learned a lot about those building blocks, right? Let's go back to the first position we talked about in this section so far. Put some uh, more pawns on the board than we've seen in the other examples. You like the YouTube thumbnail from yesterday's stream? Spencer made that. I haven't even seen it yet. <laughs> yeah, because I put one of his uh, one of the things that he said in the oh, chat on, well, <laughs> on the thumbnail. Which thing? I like when Spencer says check. Oh. <laughs> 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 it's what you see. Check. Check. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> check is important, though. In you know, in my defense. Definitely. It deserves its own special pronunciation. I would say so. In fact, in other languages, they don't they don't have different words. They just say chess for Czech. You know. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. Like they'll say like Germans will say Schach, right? And that's chess and Czech. Oh, they don't have a special word for just Czech. Right. It's some ch languages. It's chess. Yeah, they just oh, say chess. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, pretty funny. Mm -hmm. it is. All right, um, I believe it's the same in Russian too, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this position, a quick guess would say that black shouldn't win because he's got G pawns. And like we saw earlier, that's not gonna be enough to win when the pawn and rook get down here and you have a G pawn, that didn't, if you have one G pawn left, that didn't win, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Black can't win. Yeah, so here's what he says. A quick guess would tell us black can't win, 
because if he pushes his a pawn to a2 then trades the g pawn for h pawn somehow then uh, he won't be able to win like I was saying however we can compare it to this as well like that where now black to move it seems like black should win this mm -hmm. right this seems very winnable because as we see uh, we already know about if these pawns get traded and if black does this which white can't stop then black will win that position because it's a bishop pawn as we already saw from our building block all right so let's take a look at the actual moves let me just make sure that yeah all right let's look at this one first a4 I have to make it black's turn of course a4 black immediately rushes the pawn to a2 knowing this will leave the white king shackled to these squares he's not allowed to leave then which is true There we go. And now black could win by forcing the position we saw earlier. We just play f4, sacrificing the pawn. x clam takes f5 and wins. We already know the winning plan. We, we put our king here, they check us, then we play king e3. All right, we'll zugzwang him. Actually, uh, he'll have to play king g2 before we get here. Because if we go here and his pawn's hanging and we can play king f3, then we'll play king f3 after he protects his pawn. Mm -hmm. So this is a win. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he sacrificed the pawn and mm -hmm. played f5 and forced the win winning position that we already know. And you notice that white can't really do anything to avoid this because of this situation here. If white moves the king away, then we know we will win with rook h1. And it, if white tries to, like, if I go over here and white tries to attack my pawn... He can never take it because we'll move our rook and queen. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing stopping black from doing what we what we already did, the winning technique we already had demonstrated. Hmm, technically, technically. You think when he typed well, technically, he pushed his glasses up? Well, technically. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right. Um... So yeah, this position is a win for black, but the other position we can't win the same way. You know, when it was like this, this is not a win for black. At least not, you know, by force. Mm -hmm. You would, um, I wonder if, if the pawn is gone, if, it, if it's a win, like if we just took the pawn off the board. Probably not even, probably still not. I don't see how that would change it actually. But yeah, you can't win with the knight pawns because I'll just keep my king here forever. Maybe you, it would be a win if you just don't play rook a2, rook a1 and a2. Although I don't know how else you could try to win then. So yeah, this position's a draw, but the other one's a win for black. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we'll be looking at other complex situations in part 7. That's this part. Yeah. But it'll only be comprehensible if you've retained the lessons learned from the first six parts of the book. Because he's going to be building on that. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's look at rook and two connected pass pawns against rook and pawn. Positions featuring two passed pawns versus one enemy passed pawn are usually winning for the two pawns. Previous knowledge is important here too, since many positions are won by following basic rules and by exchanging a pair of pawns and creating a winning rook and pawn against rook endgame. Like the Lucina position, for example. So let's look at this position here. <laughs> Just a box in the case. There's no glasses here. <laughs> All right, so white supply here. See, so yeah, usually two connected pass pawns is going to win usually got to get our king active king f2 any other move would be terrible really because you know he might play rook b2 c4 
you gotta play king f2, get your king active. That's definitely something to remember. <clears throat> oh yeah, so you don't get cut off. Yeah, I mean you need your king in the end game. You need to you need to activate your king in the end game. Absolutely. That's like number one rule of the end game. Uh, so White's Rook prepares to place itself behind the enemy past pawns, like how we talked about in the previous section. Rook b1. Isn't king g2 the same? Sure. Probably get this exact position. He said he checked the table base. Even without the h-pawn. All right. Mm -hmm. I Thank believe you. it. Thank you for checking that. Check. Here. So obviously white's trying to make a lot of progress here, so let's check him. Now he's threatening this, so you can't push your pawn. And here. Get our king active. It's important to optimize our king's position. Absolutely. Get our rook behind the passed pawn. And this is the right time to do it because if you waited one more move and he plays g2 and then you play rook g8, he'll queen. Mm -hmm. So now after rook g1, you have to play to defend it. Like this. And then uh, now we can start to push our pawns. Check. Check. Now all you got to do is you got to avoid him moving his rook with check. So if we stupidly went to the B file, which doesn't even make sense, then uh, check would allow him to queen. Mm -hmm. In which case black probably wins. Well, even there it's close because he has to win rook against two pawns, but should win. So mm -hmm. all you got to do is move your pawns forward without allowing them the check, right? And so keep your king in front of the pawns. Here. And now the best that black can do is play rook c1 to trade the pawns. But now we're going to be in a winning king and pawn endgame. Or rook and pawn endgame, obviously. We'll check. This forces the king away. Has to go here. And then we can take this. Now they have to take our pawn. Otherwise we play c5. And then king d7. So we achieved a Lucina position with the help of that check, forcing the king up so we can move up. Oh, yeah. And now we're in a Lucina position, which is already we already explored in part mm -hmm. four, and it's an easy win. Nice. So we don't even need to look at anything else. Of course, I would have gobbled the pawn, but now I know not to do that. Oh, right. You mean here? Yeah. Right. Then this is going to maybe be a, uh, a Philidor position, perhaps. But we can still check and then keep our rook on this rank so we can't go back. This should still win. This will mm -hmm. still win. We, okay. we, we get here by force. But it was better to go ahead and check. Yeah, I mean, this saves the tempo. Like, we yeah. check and then go here, and now we already have king d7. Right, okay. Whereas if you take first and then go back and check later, we don't have time to play king d7. Our rook's hanging. So we got to make a, a weird rook move like this that you normally don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Where actually maybe it's not enough to win because of this. This stops king d7. No, I think we can do this and win, yeah. We can go here and there. Hmm, what does the engine say? Well, what we can figure it out. Yeah, this wins. You know. This, this is definitely winning. Because if you go... Uh, well, okay, this is the move, though. This might not This might not win. King here loses, for sure. But king here? Yeah, I think I could win this. Because your rook is actually too close. I can go... No, actually, I still can just do this. Yeah, losing this tempo is not is not letting us get a Lucina position here because of rook d4. You know, rook d4 draws because we, we lost the tempo here. Mm -hmm. We had to move our rook. 
So that is pretty important, if true. It might, everything I said could be a lie. Nope, that should draw point, you know, it's one plus one should draw. Mm -hmm. Is that the only, yeah, and rook d4 is the only move to draw. Nice. I really figured it out based because of what he taught me earlier. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so then it is important to go ahead and check. Yeah, we got to check first. It saves the tempo, so even if it wasn't mm -hmm. important, you might hey, as well. Yeah, can I see just what the, the bar looks like in this position? It's going to be all the way up. I would think so. Yeah, okay. Wow. All right, already can calculate a queen, mm -hmm. you know, or at least him giving up rook for pawn. Yeah, no, it's I mean, wow for the um, importance of that one. Yes, yes, Move. definitely. Definitely. All right, now we talk about when a Philidor position goes bad. <laughs> it's, it's like a, uh, sounds like a Fox promo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Polo says, so Spencer, your rating should go up 200 points. <laughs> it should. <laughs> it's going to be tough when I never play a tournament, though. <laughs> In part four, we ex explored one of the most important Rook end games one can know, the Philidor position. We saw that it offers the key to defending a pawn down Rook and pawn versus Rook end game. Uh, however, what if the Philidor position goes bad and you're not allowed to use the same defense that we saw earlier? So it will make it white to play. Yeah, we used the same diagram in, in part four, but we gave it black turn. So black played rook h6, stopping the king from moving forward. And we saw how that drew. Mm -hmm. But if it's white to move, we could obviously play rook g6 to prevent that. Got you pretty good there. Mm-hmm. Now black has to adopt a plan B. But if you don't know plan B, um, then you're, you know, it's going to be tough to defend. <laughs> so you got to know plan B. All right, let's play a few moves. King d7 here. And... Uh, rook... A6, threatening to win the rook. Mm -hmm. We'll go back to the corner. Best. And this is a common defense in rook endgames. If your rook's in the corner, it can check from the side and from behind from as far away as possible. You don't want to be like up close checking because then they can attack you. Mm -hmm. But if you're far away checking, it's harder for the opponent's king to stop the checks. True. Yeah, we don't know when we're opening yet, Polo, but hopefully this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you intend to check the enemy king, try to put as much distance between your rook and his king as possible. Rook a7 check, king e8. Now here we go, king d6. That's the tricky move. Because obviously if you check this way, we'll block with the pawn and then you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. And if we check this way, we can slink in front of our pawn, and you got no more checks. Right. So now black is, is in a difficult situation. But he can... I think it's a draw here, if I know my Philidor position well. He isn't telling us yet, but I'm pretty sure it is a draw. Our key position. This is where you must have a pre-existing knowledge of the saving idea or firm understanding of the basics to enable you to make sense of it. And yet he mentions how check and check are going to lose. And actually, black's going to have to do more than just figure out this position, as we'll see. White's trying to create a Lucina position, and black's trying to create a Philidor position. Rookie one, x clam. This makes it difficult to advance the pawn, as we'll see. Well, obviously, if you advance the pawn now, we'll check you from behind to infinity and beyond. So check. See, here's the point of rookie one. Now you can't play e6. This is like very similar to what we were just looking at, actually. When I, on our own, you know, when I was just making the moves. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we can get this position. Okay, now black has to answer another question of how to draw this, which is not easy. 
But if you remember, we talked about the short side and the long side. Yeah. And I've actually drawn this position in Blitz Chess before. That's cool. This is the short side, and that's the long side. So where do you think we're going to put our king? It's a good question for the chat. Maybe they remember from last time. I thought the king belonged on the short side, but I don't remember for sure. 50-50. So there's <laughs> more room for the rook to move around on the long side. That's true, actually. <clears throat> yeah. That's the way I remember it. But... Yeah, this is what the chat's saying, king f8. Yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. you got to keep your king on the short side. Long side, wrong side. <laughs> remember? Yeah. Short side. That's where your king was that, belongs. Was that really the saying? I didn't remember. That's what I said. Oh, I didn't remember that. That's <laughs> no, yeah, good, he didn't say it. That's a good way to remember it. Yeah. Easy, easy when things rhyme. <laughs> yeah, you got to have your king on the short side, x clamp. Mm -hmm. This is known as going to the short side, as we explored in part six. The idea is that black is leaving far more distance on the left for future checks with the rook right. against white's king, just well, like Karen said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You always want as much checking distance as possible. Mm -hmm. And here again, and we actually looked at this position already, the rook stopped at e6. Short side. Okay, now he can check us away a little further. Let's try a different idea here. Okay, a new, a new question that we have to answer. Now, passing the move doesn't work. Like, let's say we play rook e2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, king d7, oh, x clam. Yeah. This is the point of the rook move to protect the pawn. Mm -hmm. When, uh, if king f7, okay, they'll push with check. So we can try to check you. But now here, we've made progress. We can go here, mm -hmm. we can excavate our rook, go to the fourth rank. You know, give him a check and then go to the fourth rank, like how we saw and win the Lucina position. Mm -hmm. So rook e8 is a threatening move. He's threatening to go here and then push the pawn, or if you check him, go to e7 and win. So that's why we have to go for the checks, the lateral checks now with rook a1. That's the defense. As far away as possible, like we already saw. And now black is threatening to set up a Lucina draw by checking and going here, where then our rook is covering the sixth rank. And that'll draw in the way that we saw in part four, I guess, when we looked at the Lucina and Philidor positions. Mm -hmm. So he can try rook d8 to block the check. Still tough. Hoping for check here where now it's going to win for white. We're forced, we can go here next move no matter what. Well, I guess if you take, you know, I'm, not, I'm gonna take with the pawn and promote to a queen. Um, or if you go here, I fork and make you trade rooks. And if you don't do that stuff, then I'm going to get my pawn forward or my king forward. You could try this though, can't you? Hmm, you could try that. Does he give that move? Just wondering. No, no. He doesn't. Hmm. I guess I would go here, right? And then like this. Yeah, there we go. I did it. Now if you check, I'll block. And if you do anything, I'll go here. And I'll, I'm going to get into a Lucina position again as long as my king is far enough advanced. So black doesn't have to do that, obviously. Black should actually go back to e1 x clam. This makes sense because the rook here is not protecting the pawn anymore. So he can't play king d7 anymore. So rook being on e1 is enough to stop the king from stepping forward. Mm -hmm. And if the king steps backwards, we can just check him. No problem. Back to our key idea. White can't make any progress. Since Black has demonstrated his understanding of the endgame, White has no more tricks here and, and can agree to a draw. I mean, White can try the same tricks again, like go here and here. But um, otherwise, there's, there's no other ideas that White can try. Mm 
-hmm. And so this even this position still draws, even though it was a terrible version of a Philidor position when we started. Mm -hmm. We did draw by force. Wow, that is interesting. Um, Amor Srivastava says, super interesting. I always lose these end games. Then just a box in a cage has a question. If the rook was on h7, is king f8 correct? He means here. Yes. Yeah, you got to put your king on the short side. Doesn't matter where the enemy rook is in this case. Got to play king f8. Yeah, absolutely. Your rook needs to check from a distance. Otherwise, uh, like let's say that we do go here. It doesn't matter where the rook is. The point is that if we try to check from the side, uh, it's not going to work because we don't have enough checking distance. You know, like let's say we go check, and then we can try to... Uh, Yeah, we can even try to play this. I was wondering if we could try to play the same way here, trying to step the king up. Now, in the other position, we were playing rook a1, where here, in, in order to check, we can't check from the side on a1 because our king will block us. Check here, you can't check again because your king's blocking you. You check from this side, you're going to run out of checking room. Mm -hmm. You know, like I could go here, for example, or even king f6. Either way, I don't think it matters. When you check, I can just go here. I can go back and I can push now. Yeah, just making sure this is right. But now I stopped your king from approaching. Mm -hmm. Although maybe it's still a draw because I can go here and then check you away. Yeah. So I should probably... I don't know how I can win this. So if I go here, you could check. Then you still run out of checking room. But I can't ever push my pawn is a problem. Because of king d6 would be a draw. Well, maybe this isn't the right winning technique then. It's possible. Looking at the chat a little bit. Well, I was trying to figure out just a box in a cage's question. So he says, if the rook was on h7, like I think the white rook. Yeah, I already answered that. I just, right. I missed it then with the. He means here, if the rook is on h7, is king f8 still the drawing move? The answer is yes. Oh, okay. You want to keep the king on the short side. It doesn't matter where the enemy rook is. Okay, I just I didn't hear it. Um, now my curious mind wonders if chess were nine by nine. <laughs> And the pawn is on the middle square, what happens? <laughs> yeah, I would just go here in this position. No, I'm still not winning it though. In fact I'm forcing you back there, but that's gonna that's gonna be you can then go to the long or go to the short side instead of the long side. So how am I supposed to win this position? It has to be here. That's gotta be right. Maybe I could try this. That's interesting. The, the defense here was to go like this. This was the defense when the king was on the other side, the short side. Mm -hmm. You can go here. Problem with doing that is he can always play here. So yeah, I don't know how to win if they go to the wrong side. When you say win, you mean draw. I mean win. White wins here. Oh, I thought you meant, I thought you were meaning black. You're saying you didn't know how white could win. Because the easy. king is going to the wrong side. This is the long side. Oh, okay. So they. Should so I'm trying to, to figure out how that. to win, right? This yeah. has to be right. I feel like this should be the move. Well, let's mm. see what the computer says. He doesn't give how to win here. It says this, even this is a draw. Hmm. So you can go to the long side here and still draw it. Hmm. In this case. I don't know. That actually might not be true. That might not be true. But it's not making any progress. What if I try this move? Okay, it does like that move, but it still isn't really making progress. Yeah, that's why I couldn't win. This is still, even this is a draw. Yeah. 
Hmm. Does the explorer have a table base? I don't think so, but I don't know. Seems like no, people are it only has an opening stuff. explorer. Yeah. Not a uh, not a table base. Dang, that's too bad. So Pelo says, so why go to the short side? Hmm. Well, that increases your checking distance if you have to check from the side. Which you don't have to in this case. Yeah, maybe it's just his general rule for, you know. Yeah, that's definitely a, a well-known rule. That you got to put your king on the short side. But maybe in this particular one, it's not an advantage. All right. You can use table base. Good At for least... you. <laughs> I can use table base, too. <laughs> I like that little uh, crack that says Lee Chess has it. That's true. That's actually why I was expecting it. Little kappa face. <laughs> All right, now let, well, let's move on. Pawns on one side of the board. Of the, in the vast majority of endgames, the defender's drawing chances are improved with every pawn trade. We've already talked about that. Mm -hmm. This is certainly the case of a rook endgame where one... This is certainly the case in a rook endgame uh, where one side has an extra pawn. But all the pawns are situated on the same side of the board. That gives us uh, better defensive ideas. And they're based on these following things he has to say. Trade as many pawns as possible. Keep the rook as active as possible, preferably tying down the opponent's king. And keep trading down until you end up with a Philidor position, which we know from experience is a draw. All right, there's a lot of uh, pros here. Rook and two versus rook and one. In positions where there are two versus one pawn differences on one side of the board, the game is usually drawn if the stronger side doesn't have a passed pawn. So imagine a scenario where white has like H and G pawns and you have an H pawn. Okay. Everybody on the same side of the board, no passed pawns. It's usually going to be a draw in a rook end game like that. Oh, good night, Kappas. I hope to see you soon. We ha I haven't seen you much lately. Nevertheless, even in non-passed pawn situations, like let's say an E and an F pawn against an F pawn, like that, mm -hmm. uh, the defense can still be difficult in over-the-board practice. Just because something's a theoretical draw doesn't mean it's easy to achieve. Uh, the simplest two-versus-one scenario to draw is king-rook H and G pawns versus king-rook and G pawn. However, even here, good players have known to botch the defense and lose. That's the easiest scenario you can get. They got this and you have a G pawn. That's, that's the easiest to draw, but even still you can lose it. Unfortunately, in cases where one side does have a pass pawn, these endgames often prove far more complex than one might imagine. For example, one side has a passed pawn, as in E and F pawn against G pawn. Like this. Mm -hmm. Then obviously you have a passed E pawn. Yeah. Now the, strong side, the stronger side has serious winning chances. There are several reasons for this. One, the stronger side's king will enjoy more cover than its counterpart. Two, the stronger side can usually, or I'm sorry, the stronger side can use his great force to push the opponent back and ideally win the defender's remaining pawn. Obviously with two extra pawns, it should be a pretty easy win. Next, the stronger side can push his pawns to the fifth or sixth rank, exchanging a pair of pawns and ending up with a favorable king, rook, and pawn against king situation where the weaker side won't be able to get, for example, Philidor defense. And finally, the pass pawn will always be threatening to go somewhere, forcing the defender to deal with that on top of everything else. Like the pass pawn could be too strong at some point. You have to always avoid letting the pass pawn get too strong where you can't handle it. Mm -hmm. Or you don't have to worry about that as much when they don't have a pass pawn, obviously. Is trading down the pawns like for any endgame or just rook endgames? If you're worse, you like to trade pawns, yes. It's always easier to win when you have more pawns because you have more chances to queen. See, so yeah, generally, if you're worse or losing in an endgame, you want to trade pawns in a rook endgame or any endgame. Yeah. Uh, so per he says personally he's met very few players under twenty four hundred who have mastered the difference to the different two verse one scenarios on the same side of the board, and why should they? De defensive technique is hard to quantify. All right, let's see. I'll skip ahead because he's talking talk on nonsense here. 
useful advice. Stick with the basics and with new patterns that he's going to show you, and it should be easier to understand these endgames. We can still acquire a basic understanding of many 2 vs 1 situations by making use of a simple defensive flowchart. 1. Don't allow a losing rook and 1 vs rook position to occur. We've already seen examples of that. So, um, like for example, if the defending king gets trapped on the other side of the board and can't prevent a Lucina position. Mm -hmm. uh, trading pawns to get into a Philidor position. That's a way to do it. Uh, a king and pawn in game might occur. You'll need to make occasional use of your knowledge of trebuchet, like we talked about, mm -hmm. um, and other king and pawn in games. Finally, you'll need to know the drawing technique for failed Philidor positions that we just found out about, which is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Hey, Alan. Hola. All right, let's see the, from this position and uh, see if we can defend it or what the deal is. We'll have two against one, but no passed pawns yet. Like this. White to move. All right, so yeah, this is two against one, and uh, it's no rook pawn, which makes it gives it some more winning chances, right? Mm -hmm. That's why it's easier to draw if it's like H and G against G pawn. And... Uh, so no rook pawns and no passed pawn, though no passed pawn makes it a little tougher to win. So with perfect play, though, it would be a draw? I'm guessing a draw, yeah. But because it's not on the edge of the board, there's some um, a little bit more winning chance. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even even in the toughest, or the, the I'm sorry, the easiest draw, when the pawn is here and these pawns are on H and G, mm -hmm. even, that's the easiest position to draw, and even that you can lose. Okay. Like, you're going to need to know how to defend. All right, so let's say king g5. Uh, this frees the f pawn, allowing it to advance. And rook c5. So he's trying to stop the f pawn from advancing, obviously. This is an important move. Mm -hmm. Trying to check from a distance won't work this time. Rook c1. That was probably what I would do. <laughs> This position occurred in 1996, actually, a game between people I never heard of. White played rook a6 doing nothing, which isn't right. Instead, white can force a win. Check. King e8. f5. Now, okay, this is a scenario where the two pawns are very far advanced that he talked about. Mm -hmm. Rook h1, also possible is rook c5, but then king f6, check, e6, takes, takes. Mm -hmm. And now this is like what happens when you your Philidor position goes wrong, because we got our pawn and our king to the sixth rank, and you can't check us from behind now. Right. You have to stop mate so you can try this. We'll go here. And this forces the trade of rooks and wins the game. So rook h1 was another defense you could try. Rook b8 check. f6 check. You've got to defend this pawn. This isn't going to work because we will check and go here. So like this. Oh, actually, you know what he gives? Uh, he gives if you go. If you go here, he'll check, and instead of doing this, he'll just play e6 immediately. Which also wins. Yes, mm -hmm. we got have a passed pawn now. So here. Right. Even this seems like it could draw. <laughs> but now we can Zugzwang black. We'll play king g4 x-clan. Any rook move allows us to take it, of course. Um, well, you could still try king e6, right? 
Well, actually, you know what? Any king move is going to be rook e8. He gives here. And after rook e7, then we'll play e6. So, like, let's say this, for example. Rook e7. Our next move is going to be e6. Even if you play king here, I can play e6. Because it's pinned. And this is going to win for sure. Oh, yeah. We just win the pawn. And the game. Let's see, no questions about that. It's pretty tough, though. Mm -hmm. So this move... Which is the normal defense is not gonna get is not gonna cut it. We saw that we can try to win by bringing our rook back around here, forcing this rook here, and then winning with the e6 break. So that's why we we can go here. This is the right defense. This stops us from pushing our pawn. Check. There was another game from ninety three. Marcus was was white against Lenhart. Uh, white gave black a chance to move off the rank by going here. And then after rook b5, which does nothing also, then check. When the game was agreed, draw. Which is crazy, by the way. <laughs> That's nuts. Like, white should try to win this, of course. Mm -hmm. Like, what's going on here? Um, White didn't, in fact, he says White didn't realize that there's still a lot of tricky chess to be played. But they were already on move 91. And probably he was just ready to draw the game, even though he's better here. So not the best winning spirit, in my opinion. But, okay, that's just one man's opinion. Check. And king f8. This is the x clam defense. Not what you might expect. You know, like, I'd be trying to play king e6, right? That's what I was about to say, yeah. Yeah. But here we actually lose check. Mm -hmm. Sacrificing our pawn. Check again. And this. And now we're going to be in a Lucina position. We can get our king in front of our pawn. Mm. So that's why it's important to know that other stuff. Like mm -hmm. he was saying. Got to get that flow chart going. <laughs> <laughs> king f8. And f5. Still a winning move. Uh, he also gives king h6 to h7. but And this looks great, but then they'll play f6. Trading the pawn uh, under more favorable circumstances, clearly. Mm -hmm. So f5, hanging our pawn. Then we'll go here. We're threatening the rook, and we're almost threatening mate, but not really. But we can just go take this pawn. Yeah. Now you could try to get the king and pawn in game, right? Mm -hmm. I guess you'd try this, wouldn't you? Yeah. But now you can't go for a, a trebuchet if you check and black goes here, black's winning. Because it's white's turn. Oh, yeah. So uh, you can't win this position this way. You should try to take that pawn. That's a good way to win. At least try to. Be up a pawn. Might as well. Right. So this is pretty tough. This looks like black is not quite in a Philidor position. Because, like, his rook isn't here getting ready to check from the side. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. Uh, but white isn't in a Lucina position yet, because we haven't gotten our king and pawn far enough down the board. So, it's not clear if this is a win or not. Rook f1, x clam. This is the key idea. It ties the white king to the defense of its pawn, and prevents the pawn from advancing in this way. Like, if you check and go here, I can't move my king up to f7. Just take it. This is very similar to the Philidor gone bad position that we already looked at. Mm -hmm. Let's see uh, how we can try it here. Threatening f6. King g8. Now, if f6, we're in a Philidor position at this point, where they push the pawn and we check from behind. 
that's what we want because mm -hmm. then he can't go in front of his pawn anymore. Right. That's yeah. how he looked in the first, or when we first looked at the Philidor position. So we can try this. It doesn't matter. Let him check us. And rook f8. See, we've seen this idea before as well. Um, threatening king e7. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we've got to check from the side again. Rook a2. Good thing our king is on the short side. Yeah, this is definitely a situation where having all this checking room is going to draw, where it wouldn't draw if the king and rook were flipped. It almost certainly would not draw. You wouldn't even have any checking distance Right. Yeah. in that case. Well, maybe it would, actually. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Anyways, it's obviously a lot better to have this checking distance. Rook e8, we already saw trying to meet the check here, but then we can defend the same way we saw earlier with rook f2. Now we can't move our king out without... Mm -hmm. We can't move it forward and push the pawn. It's not going to work. And this is ending up drawing. White can't make any progress. As we've, we've seen that the stronger side's chances in rook and two versus rook and one are based on pushing his pawns to the fifth rank, which creates a squeeze against the defending king and pressure against the weaker side's final pawn. With that in mind, the defender can't wait passively for his opponent to tighten the screws. Here's the next example to show us what he's talking about here. Yeah, like a lot of times when you're defending, you can make waiting moves, and sometimes you can't, so it's kind of difficult to know. I'm sure you've run into that situation yourself, mm -hmm. as have I. Let's see what anybody says. This looks like a draw. This is Spencer says. I think he meant the previous position. Yeah, because you just <laughs> Which put was that correct. one there. <laughs> so in this position, it's black to move, and black can draw this with best play. But if you wait around with a move like rook f7, then we'll get c5, and black is getting squeezed here. We can try to win it the same way we looked at earlier when it was two against one, and and we and he lost with black, but we can just avoid this. We don't want to let his pawns get here. B6. Easy stuff. White has no winning chances at all here. He can't advance without trading the pawns. You know, like here. Mm -hmm. And if you check king b7, that's no problem, obviously. So the only way to make progress is to eventually push, but that'll be a, a Philidor draw easy, because our king's here... And we've got space so we don't get, you know, you don't get a Lucina position or even a difficult Philidor position. Now, this is the end of the variation, even. How about this position, though? Here? There? Slap a couple rooks down. Oh, that's too many rooks. It's like too many grandmas. <laughs> Faster grandma. Grandma's gaining on us. Did Ben come in? Into the chess club? I don't, I don't uh. know. What's up, AB sequence? Hey, AB sequence. Thought I heard something, but I didn't hear the door slam. All right, so white to move. This is a draw, too. Oh, I put this rook on the wrong square. Should be there. That's better. Yeah, this is a draw as well. The problem White faces is that even if he succeeds in pushing his G-pawn and trading it for the F-pawn, uh, that that's going to probably be a Philidor position. Mm -hmm. But it's the only plan that White has. So Rook D5, Rook A4, let's pin it, why not? Trading Rooks would be ridiculous, of course. So I'm not even going to look at that. G5. Takes, takes, king f6. Well, black will get a Philidor position. Even if things get out of hand and he gets the bad version of the Philidor position, even that's a draw. All right, let's talk about... You want to keep going, by the way? Um, possibly. Let me see if he texted real quick. Because right. um, we had talked about him starting... 
I think we haven't been going quite two hours. An hour and 45 minutes about. Right. And so I think we could go make maybe another five or ten minutes, and then I could play just like one or two games at the end, or, or not play if he gets here. I'm not sure when he's coming. He didn't text. So, yeah, let's just keep going a little. All right. Because we'll hear it when he comes in, and it takes him a little while to set up. Ben is streaming after me, so we were just mm -hmm. trying not to imp clash. impinge on his <laughs> streaming time because already he's starting late because I started late. Oh, there he is. Wait, I heard something. That was him. Well, that could have been Archer. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? All right, we'll do another one more position. He'll come in here. Yeah, this is getting pretty technical. Even mm -hmm. I have trouble figuring out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it, yeah. <laughs> I'll have yeah. to go back and review it for sure. Rook in three versus Rook in two. This common endgame is also a draw if black has prevented white's pawns from eating up too much space. Um, so here we go. White to move. This is black's worst nightmare. Black's losing in this position because white's pawns are too strong. Usually this kind of debacle is caused by passive play. So black probably earlier played a little bit too passively mm -hmm. to allow this position. King h5. So the idea here is that he wants to play f6 check, but doesn't want to let you move your king up. So king h5 is a preparatory move. Rook d8. Because after check, it's going to be mate on the back rank. So rook d8 prevents mate. Here. Now black's helpless because any rook move off the back rank would allow a mate. So you have to just shuffle on the first rank here. Yeah, this move prevents e6, except for one thing, <laughs> e6. Anyways, x-clam. And black can resign. Well, obviously, rook takes gets mated, mm. frankly. And this is also pretty bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, not doing anything is bad, too, because I'm threatening to take or even push and win like this. So yeah, if you defend really passively when it's three against two, you run the risk of getting under mating threats. Mm -hmm. And this is what helped white win the game. Black couldn't defend with the rook. You can't play rook takes pawn, for example, because his back rank is too weak. So you have to avoid this kind of situation if you have two against three. All right, let's look at another one. Yeah, let's keep going. I'm not sure. He, he usually comes in here when he gets here anyway. Like this. So we still got three against two going. And those black pawns, come on. <laughs> Useful advice. Don't play passively and let the superior side's pawns march down the board and eat up every bit of space. Good good tip. Even here, this looks pretty good for white. Mm -hmm. I would say probably white wins. But I don't know. White has achieved a dominant pawn position and can now force a win, he says, by mixing two plans. One is moving the king and rook out of the way, then playing c4, c5, c6. Another is placing the rook on the seventh rank, pinning the pawn, and playing d6. So with those, both of those ideas put together, white can win this position by force. Rook e6. It's important to move to the e-file, since we can play here and then we won't get checked. I don't really know why. I mean, why can't I be on the F-file for that? You know? Oh, I know. I know what he means. Because this pawn is here, right? So, like, even if we play rook e7 later and then king c6 and he checks us, we can go here because it's protected. Oh, okay. Whereas if we played rook f7... And king c6, he could check us. We just have to go back. Oh, okay. So, yeah. That makes sense. All right. Rook c1. This is forced because if we play a waiting move, he'll go here threatening this. And once you get out of the way of the pin, then we can step forward. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks Yay. for the subscription, Nicola. Yay, thank you, Nicola. I appreciate it. So. Thank you for the 1,000 centuries. Oh, nice. Yep. Doubling up on us. Nicola is <laughs> very generous on all the streams. Rook C1 prevents that because now if we go here and he moves the king back, we can't step up because we'll okay. lose our pawn. Okay, yeah. Rook E8, X clam. Now, this is a great move. I really like this. It forces black to waste a move mm -hmm. and thereby losing checking distance. Like here. Again, if you go off the C file, like this, for example, right. and I go here, I'm threatening this. And then when you get out of the way of the pin, I'll go here. So he needs to keep his work on the C file to protect or attack the C pawn, thereby stopping me from moving my king up. So we'll play rook c2. Yeah, we're doing the whole book polo, and they're both on video on demand and on YouTube, the mm -hmm. ones we've done already. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if a6, that's not going to work either. We get to take, and we'll cut the king off with rook b8. Oh, yeah. And that'll be a pretty easy win. How's it going? Mm -hmm. So rook c2. We're almost done here. So now he's got less checking distance because we made him move to c2. Rook e1 x clam. Just exactly the move I would play. Except for one thing. Now black's rook doesn't have access to the first rank. So we're going to move our king. And then you're only going to get one check. Then we can stop you. And once we move our king out of the way, then we can push our pawns and, and win in the way that we saw in the previous example. And again, the rook has to stay on the, the c-file, though. Because mm -hmm. if the rook ever moves away, we play rook e7. And if you move your king, we play rook c6. King c6, even. And then we can play c5 after. So rook c3. We can go this way. So if... I'm sorry. Go back. This. Yes. I just couldn't visualize. So if king b4 to get out of the way, you were saying the king would come back? Oh, yeah, but it's black's turn, so black has to move. Um, so he went here, and then we got our king out of the way like this. Oh, okay. oh that's right. Yeah, you couldn't retreat. To, that, that was the point of the rook e1. Right. Maybe. Yeah, now we, okay. can't, we can't make this waiting move. We oh, have to, we have to make this waiting move, okay. which is a lot less convenient, clearly. All right. And we can go here. This is a typo in the book. Oh, really? Yeah, it says avoiding the annoyance of f5. This is not f5, that's c5. Oh. Rook d2 check. <laughs> I mean, I didn't set it up wrong. Nope. <laughs> this yeah. Is a, well, it's a big typo because, you know, it's not mm. f5. I yeah, but it, these, I found a lot of books have typos. So oh, this definitely. This is the first one you've noticed. Yeah. Big one? That's not well, there's another one where he said, like, trying to go to a, a3. Mm -hmm. But I think he meant A2. Oh. But they were kind of close, and you I guess he could have gone A3. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think he meant A2 and it was a typo. But yeah, yeah. this is definitely, that's a huge typo. The that's definitely is, wrong. I'm sure been reprinted a few times. It's Giggle Master's Benzu. <laughs> <laughs> it is Benzu. He's a little bit in the frame. Right. Who framed Benzu? <laughs> it's like yeah. he's Roger Rabbit. Yeah, we've done basically one part per day, but sometimes... Not quite finishing. Mm -hmm. That's true. So C5, that's what you want. Success. Mm -hmm. Check. King D4. We could block with the rook, which is nice. Goes here to stop us from going there. King B4, X clam. And the idea is that if you play uh, takes, is this right? No, no, see, I must have skipped a move. Give me one second. Let's see what I did wrong here. King d4, rook h4, rook e4, king e4. Oh, you're going to go ahead and start? Okay. After uh -huh. rook h7, it's rook e8. Rook h4, check. Rook h5. If you keep checking, I'm going to go to a5. 
king b4 x clam. This is where we can sacrifice the pawn. Because if they take it, we check them. They have to go here, only legal move, and then mate. Mm -hmm. So a5, interesting try. Here, there, now it's not mate if check king a7. I should still do that. Then we can go like this. Have to go here, only reasonable move. Like this. Now we're threatening mate again. And then b6. Crushing move. Obviously taking is queens. Not taking is not really effective. Well, you have to play rook c8, I think, yeah. here, where this move wins, as does this. I like this because it's sort of like Zook Swan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to go here and get forked. You could take, and king takes. Well, we've actually looked at this position in part four, and white wins it. We can, uh, after he moves his work away, we can, I'm oh, sorry, we can go here, and then, or you can even check first, I guess. Yeah. And if you, well, okay, nothing to do there. Yeah. So black loses here. So clearly the, the defender can't allow his opponent to march his pawns down the board in this fashion. By strategically placing the black pawns so that any white advance leads to soothing exchanges, the game can usually be, be saved. We'll look at some examples of those next time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's probably a good stopping point. Yeah, absolutely. So that's chapter still, still chapter seven. Yeah, that's a very dense chapter. Definitely, because it's so much harder. And maybe absolutely. I don't know if it's longer, but well, it's not as long as part like five. That was the longest. Yeah, or whichever one that was. I think it was five. Mm -hmm. That was easier, so you could go faster. <laughs> yeah, that it tired me out. Yeah, it was pretty tough. Mm -hmm. But I think we learned a lot. I know. Definitely. I did.